Hi Rockridge, this is Mrs. Berger and today we're going to talk about the discrete math unit one. This is the math of voting and so we're going to go through various ways to assess the results of an election. Um, we're going to discuss the majority and plurality elements of an election. We're going to discuss the board account method. We'll discuss the plurality with elimination method and we will discuss the pairwise comparison method. So let's go ahead and see what we are starting with, what we're working with. What we typically have are the results of an election, uh, which is a pile of ballots basically. So these are 37 different ballots that you might have received um, after uh, an election for the math club president. And the candidates in this election are Alicia, Boris, Carmen, and Dave. And the preference ballots that each voter turned in show that person's first, second, third, and fourth place preference. So they didn't just vote for who they want to win, their uh, first choice. They also said, if my first choice doesn't win, I would rather this one, and then this one, and then this one. And so if you were in class, you actually ran an election like this for yourselves, and you collected results from that election. For this video, we will be using this example to explain all the different methods. So this 37 voter election for president of the math club is what we'll use throughout this lesson. So what you do with this is you sort all of these ballots into piles and you count how many people voted the same way. And so you go through and you say, okay, all of the ballots that are of this type, A, B, C, D, will be put in a pile and counted. And then all of the ballots of this type B, D, C, A will be put in a pile and counted and so forth. So that's what's been done here. This is called a preference schedule. Preference schedule. So when you take the preference votes and put them into a table like this and count up how many people voted the same way, you have created a preference schedule. So this is 14 people that voted Alicia first, Boris second, Carmen third, and Dave fourth. Now let's talk a little bit about some math of voting here. The big point that we want to make sure we understand is that even though we're going to go through all these different voting systems uh, and, and assessment systems and methods, there's no one way to do this right. Every single method has a problem. And the reason for this is uh, in some voting methods, you will solve one problem and then still run into another problem. That's called Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. Basically, it's impossible to come up with a perfect way to assess all the different um, votes without any shortcomings. That's Arrow's Impossibility Theorem. All of the different voting methods have a problem. So, in your preference schedule, when you did this uh, as a project, you might take a look at your preference table, your preference schedule, and you might say, well, I'm used to declaring that the, pre the person with the most first choice votes, Alicia, is the winner. That's probably what you're used to when you talk about election results. That's called plurality. If you are simply counting the candidate with the most first place votes, you have chosen the plurality winner. You have used the plurality method. You can also rank your candidates using plurality. So you can say not only was Alicia in first with her 14 first place votes, you can also determine second place. Alicia with 14 gets first place. Notice that Carmen has 11 first place votes. Dave has 8 first place votes. And Boris has 4 first place votes. So next in line is Carmen with 11 first, pl first place votes and then Dave with eight first place votes and then Boris with four first place votes. That's plurality. That's ranked plurality. Plurality with rankings. 
Alicia gets first, Carmen gets second. Don't forget to give Carmen not only those ten, but also this one. Dave gets eight, and Boris gets four first place votes. And we have not looked at any other part of the table. We only care about the top row if we're assessing this for plurality. Let's look at how, which candidate had the most last place votes. Let's look at last place now. Dave has 14 last place votes. Alicia has 10 plus 8, that's 18, plus 4, that's 22, plus 1, 23. So Dave has 14 last place. Alicia has 23 last place. Does that change our opinion about the winner? You may have said Alicia was the winner because she had the most first place votes, but she also has the most last place votes. So this is a point of interest when we're doing plurality. Now, majority. You may have heard this term before. Let's make sure that you understand it from a uh, math perspective. Majority means you have more than half of the first place votes. So how do you know if your plurality winner earned a majority? Your plurality winner only has a majority if they have more than half of the first place votes. Remember, we had 37 people vote in this election. 37 people means a majority, 37, more than half of 37 means I need to have 19 for a majority. That's more than half. I need to have 19 votes in order to get a majority of these 37. Remember what we said. Alicia had 14 first place, Carmen had 11, Dave had 8, and Alicia had 4. I'm sorry, Boris had 4. Boris had 4. Did anybody earn a majority of the first place votes? Alicia certainly did not. She only had 14. So my plurality winner did not have a majority. And that's possible. Sometimes we can have a majority winner, I'm sorry, we could have a plurality winner that did not earn a majority, more than half of the votes. The majority criterion says if a candidate wins the majority of first place votes, the candidate should be the winner. Now in this case, our winner did not have a majority of first place. We can violate the majority criterion. Again, remember, there's no perfect voting method. So if we go with plurality in this particular instance, there's a chance that we could violate the majority criterion. And certainly in several of everybody's elections, you had a plurality winner who did not have a majority. This is an interesting thing that will come up a little bit later, but the Condorcet criterion is another criterion that might be violated. If a candidate is preferred over every other candidate when you compare them head to head, so Alicia compared to Boris, Alicia compared to Carmen, Alicia compared to Dave, Boris compared to Carmen, Boris compared to Dave, and so on. If they are preferred over all of their other candidates, they should win the election. That is called the Condorcet criterion and that winner is called the Condorcet winner. And certainly we could have that happen in our elections. Insincere voting. Insincere voting or strategic voting. This is something in which uh, plurality results could be manipulated. So think of this as uh, in United States elections, you might have a Republican Party candidate, a Democratic Party candidate, and maybe the independent candidate. And if you truly feel like your favorite candidate is the independent candidate, but you don't think they have any chance of winning, 
and you vote for one of the Republican or Democrat candidates, that's insincere voting. Strategic voting. That's saying, I know my candidate won't win. They have no chance of winning. So I'm going to vote for somebody I think has a better chance, even though that is not my first choice. That's called insincere voting or strategic voting. Instead of wasting their vote, they choose an alternate candidate that has a better chance. Now, that likely didn't happen in any of our elections in class. I don't think anybody feels so strongly that chocolate chip cookies will be the preferred cookie over every other cookie, um, but their favorite oatmeal raisin has no chance of winning, so they're going to go ahead and throw in with the chocolate chip cookie crowd to beat out the double chocolate chip cookie crowd. That probably did not happen in our elections. But in elections where people feel passionate about these things, insincere voting is absolutely possible. Now, we'll look at our second method, the Borda count method. The Borda count method works on a point system. So if you were to use a point system to determine the winner, how would you do it? When I asked this question in class, several students said, well, if I look at my preference schedule, I notice that we've got first, second, and third choice, and so I would award points for each place. Maybe I would award them one point for first place, two points for second, three points for third, and four points for fourth, and then score it like golf. Whoever has the smallest score wins. Other people said, no, wait a minute. I think the lowest choice, the, the least preferred candidate, should get the least points, and the first preferred candidate should get the most points. So I would give them one point for last place, and then two points for third, three points for fourth, third, uh, excuse me, three points for second, and the most points goes to first place. That last method is exactly how board account assigns points. Now in board account, note that a, first, uh, a fourth place candidate like Dave here gets one point. But also notice that 14 people gave, them, gave Dave those, that one point. So in this block, Dave has earned 14 points. In this block, Carmen has earned 28 points, two points from 14 different people, and so on and so forth. You can fill in the points for each candidate. So in this row, 10 people gave Alicia one point, 10 people gave Dave two points, 10 people gave, Dave, uh, gave Boris three points, 10 people gave Carmen four points, in this row, eight people gave Alicia one point. Boris earned 16 points here. Carmen earned 24. Dave earned 32. Alicia gets four. Carmen gets eight. Dave gets 12. Boris gets 16. Alicia gets one. Boris gets two. Dave gets three. Carmen gets one. Let's go back and finish this one. 3 times 14 is 42, and then 4 times 14 is 56. That's how you award points to candidates, and as you can probably imagine, you would add all these points up and determine the winner based on the max number of points. Go ahead and pause the video and try to do that. Okay, hopefully you've had a chance to do that. Uh, hopefully you found my mistake up here. I accidentally gave Carmen one point when um, she should have gotten four. And you went through the table and added all the different points for all the different candidates. So Alicia should have gotten 79, Boris 106, Carmen 103, Dave 81. If not, pause the video and take a look at where your math went wrong. Um, definitely attention to detail helps here. Now, how can we check to make sure that all these points are right? Let's think about it this way. How many points are there allotted for the entire election? How many voters were there? There were 37 voters in this election, and we could find that by adding all of these up, right? And how many points did each voter hand out? When they turned in their ballot, how many points did each voter turn in? They turned in a point for first place, uh, fourth place, a point for second place, so one point for fourth place, plus two points for third place, plus three points for second place, plus four points for first place. So in this particular election, in this election, each ballot was worth ten points. 
So 10 points times 37 voters is 370 points offered up in this election. The total number of points offered in this election was 370. The total number of points on each ballot was 10. So the total for all the different candidates should add to 370. So that's a little check you can do for yourself in case you're worried about any of your addition. And again, everybody makes mistakes. I accidentally awarded the wrong points to Carmen, so find those mistakes, make sure that they add to 370. Now while we're here, let's also do a little check for ourselves. What's the minimum number of points any of these candidates could ever get? How would we find that out? Well, if everyone who voted, all 37 people, made somebody last place or their last choice, they would all be awarding that candidate one point. So the least number of votes a candidate could have is one point times 37 voters, or 37 points. On the other hand, the most points a candidate could have is what? That would be if every candidate on every ballot, if that candidate on every ballot was awarded the max number of points. The max number of points on a ballot is four points in this particular election. And in this particular election, there were 37 voters. So the max number, the most number of points a candidate could walk away from this election with is 148. So this is another check. Did any of our candidates make less than 37 points or more than 148? Because that's impossible. And we look at A, B, C, and D, and none of them um, exceed those bounds. So be able to answer all of those questions. How many points on a single ballot? How many points in the entire election? The least number of points a candidate could earn in the election. And the most number of points a candidate could earn in the election. And so that's what the rest of these um, notes, how many points could each voter give out? In this election, it's 10. Entire election, that's 370. Highest number of first place points. And what I mean by that is just the high, highest number of points. And we saw that, 4 times 37. Lowest number of points. Lowest number of points, 37. Um, when we had our own elections, I had the, the students in place uh, rank the candidates. So you would rank, um, you would give Boris first place, because he had the most points. You would give Carmen second place. You would give Dave third place. And Alicia actually ends up in fourth place. So that's interesting. That's completely against our plurality method. All right, that is board account. That's method number two. So the first method was just plurality, just the most first place votes. And then we looked at whether or not that was a majority. The second method was board account. And now we will clear the board and we will do the third method. This third method is called plurality with elimination. Plurality with elimination is very similar to plurality. Um, it comes about, and actually it happens in real, in real life, so in local or municipal elections for sheriff or for um, board of supervisors, you might have more than two people running, okay? Usually they don't have party affiliations. They're, they're not Republican or Democrat. They're just people running for sheriff. And so you might have two or three or four. You might have more than two candidates. And in that case, whoever wins the plurality, the most first place votes, may not have a majority. And so many times we do something called runoff. This definitely happened in some of our elections in class. When this happens, the candidate with the fewest first place votes is taken off the ballot because we know they don't have a chance of winning. And then the remaining candidates go into a runoff election, another election, and all the voters come back to the polls and they vote again. And of course, that's incredibly expensive and inefficient. And that's because the plurality winner, the one with the most first place votes, did not have a majority of the first place votes, more than half. Now, in our elections, we actually don't need to do all that. We don't need to bring our voters back because we have their second, third, and fourth choice. Because we have that, 
in our preference schedules, we are going to work until we find the candidate that has a majority of the votes. Now I'm going to demonstrate this. If you like writing steps down, you're more than welcome to, but I'll demonstrate this on our ballot for our math club election. The first thing you do is you look at the first place votes of the candidates using plurality. If your plurality winner, the one with the most first place votes, has more than half, you don't have to continue. You have your winner. They have more than half. If you don't have a majority winner, start by crossing out the candidate with the least first place votes from every column. Remember, you yank the candidate with the least votes off and then rerun the election. Recount the first place votes. If a candidate was from reviewed, removed from the top of the column, give those first place votes to the next candidate down. If now you have a plurality winner, because that has a majority, that has more than half, stop, you've got your winner. If your plurality winner doesn't yet have a majority, keep going. And we keep repeating these steps until we have a plurality winner that also has a majority. This is called plurality with elimination, or runoff. Let's see how plurality with elimination works out in our election. Plurality with elim. So we know that Alicia has 14 first place votes, Carmen has 11, Dave has 8, and Boris has 4. And we know that Alicia does not have a majority yet. So since we don't have a majority, we go through with our first step, eliminating the candidate with the least first place votes. Careful on this. It is Boris that has the least first place votes, not Carmen. Boris has 4 first place votes, Carmen has 11. So eliminate Boris first from everywhere. And if we're keeping tally, fourth place now goes to Boris. They're the first one to be eliminated, so they get last place. Now that Boris is eliminated, let's find out how many first place votes A, C, and D have. A has 14, C has 11, and D now has 8 plus 4. Notice that Dave earns the 4 that Boris left behind. So Dave has 12. Now remember, in order to have a majority, we needed 19. Does anyone have a majority yet? The answer is no, nobody right yet has a 19. So now we eliminate the next one with the least first place votes. And out of 14, 11, and 12, Carmen has the least first place votes. So Carmen is removed from every ballot, and Carmen earns third place. And now we run it again between Alicia and Dave. Alicia has 14. Dave earns these 10, these 8, these 4, and this 1. Because Dave is next in line for all of those. So Dave earns the remaining 23 votes. Dave earns a majority. Dave wins first place, and Alicia gets second place. So we yet again have a different winner using this method. Plurality elimination takes some practice, so definitely take a minute to practice this and make sure that you understand the order of the steps. So that's plurality with elimination. Now we'll talk about our fourth and final method, pairwise comparison. Pairwise comparison are basically head-to-head -head battles between all the candidates. Remember the Condorcet criterion? The Condorcet criterion... Oh, sorry, let me finish this. Oh, yes, we talked about all this, right? Plurality with elimination. Which candidate won? Uh, how many candidates did you have? How many rounds of elimination? And how many first place votes did you have in the final round? Is it a majority? It should be a majority. So let me move on to my... Um, discussion about Condorcet criterion. Remember the Condorcet criterion 
the candidate has to be preferred over other candidates when compared head-to-head. -head. So head-to-head -head battles. So when you think pairwise comparison, think head-to-head -head battles. Everybody versus everybody. Pairwise comparisons. Now, in our math club election, in order to look at these candidates head-to-head, -head, you list each pair of candidates. So for our particular election, all the different battles that could happen one-on-one -on -one are Alicia versus Boris, Alicia versus Carmen, Alicia versus Dave, Boris versus Carmen, Boris versus Dave, and Carmen versus Dave. So in the kids in class, I had them set up their elections, their head-to-head -head battles, to have every candidate versus every other candidate. That is the first step of pairwise comparison. Let me repeat this work back on our table so that we can look at the numbers. We will need to compare A versus B, A versus C, A versus D, B versus C, B versus D, and C versus D. Do not repeat B versus A. It, the battle results will still be the same. We don't want to um, duplicate, and we certainly don't want to leave battles out. So make sure that you have everybody versus everybody. And order doesn't matter as long as you've accounted for every battle option. Now, the way you win a battle is that when compared to the other person, you're higher on the pile. So for A versus B, A in the first column, A is higher than B, so A gets those 14. So A is preferred over B 14 times in this column. In the second column, B is preferred over A 10 times. In the third column, B is preferred over A for 8 voters. In the fourth column, B is preferred over A for 4 voters. And in the last column, B is preferred over A for 1 voter. So that means in this battle, a is preferred over B 14 times, B is preferred over A 10 plus 8 plus 4 plus 1 23 times. In this battle, in this battle, B gets the point. In this head-to-head -head battle, B gets the point. B wins. Now we go with C, A versus C. So we look at the preferences and we see in uh, how many people preferred A over C. So we do the same thing. We look at A over C. A is preferred over C 14 times. C is preferred over A for 10 voters. C over A for 8 voters. C over A for 4 voters. And C over A for 1 voter. So very similarly, we have another situation where A is preferred over C 14 times, C is preferred over A 23 times. So in this head-to-head -head battle, C gets the point. A versus D. For A versus D, we look at that and we count it up. And again, it's 14 versus 23. D gets that point. Now we look at B versus C. B versus C. In this, B is preferred over C 14 times. C is preferred over B for those 10 times. C is preferred over B for those 8 times. B is preferred over C 4 times. So now we've got 18. So 18 times B is preferred over C versus the 19 times C is preferred over B. And again, preferred over just means you're higher on the preference list. So this means C gets the point. In B versus D, it ends up being 28 to 9. If you need to pause the video and work this out for yourself, I highly encourage that. Count them up and see if you match with me. C versus D, you have 25 versus 12. So in the B versus D battle, B gets the point. In the C versus D battle, C gets the point. So when we rank our candidates, the person with the least points, A has not earned any battle points. So A is in last place. 
It looks like C has earned the most battle points with three points, so C gets first place. It looks like B is second place because they've earned two battle points, so that's um, second place. And then D has one point, so they're in third place. Once again, if your work doesn't match this or you haven't caught up, please pause the video and make sure that you follow those steps. One last little note. If in any particular battle, like in class, in class we had 16 voters, and a lot of times the candidates, let's say um, chocolate chip and oatmeal, chocolate chip versus oatmeal, maybe eight voters preferred chocolate chip over oatmeal, and maybe eight voters preferred oatmeal over chocolate chip, they had ties. In a tie, one half point goes to the one candidate, and half a point goes to the other candidate and then you tally up the battle points just like we did here. You cannot award more or less than one point per battle. One point goes to the winner or half a point goes to each tie winner. No points goes to the loser. That's how you do pairwise comparison. So let me run through the written notes for that just to review. For each pair we compare them one point when a candidate is preferred over the other, half a point when there's a tie. The candidate with the most points wins. This method satisfies both the majority criterion and the Condorcet criterion. There are other problems with it, we won't get into those details right now, but those two criterion are satisfied with the pairwise comparison method. All right, you will be able to use these notes when you take the assessment. Go ahead and try your practice test now and let us know if you have questions.